You are listening to Rat Lines, The Hunt for Nazi War Criminals, Episode 5, Dr. Death, written and narrated by Mark Felton. This is an audio episode for War Stories with Mark Felton. British filmmaker Dov Friedman's heart beat a lot faster in his chest as he peered intently at the very old man who shuffled towards the front door of a large house in the German spa town of Baden-Baden in 2008. Friedman was making a documentary for the BBC called The Last Nazis, and the camera had been following famed Israeli Nazi hunter Dr. Ephraim Zurov in his quest to capture the most prominent Nazi war criminal that was believed by many to still be at large. Sitting quietly in a car parked on the pretty, tree-lined residential street, 33-year-old Friedman thought that he had found his quarry. The most chilling part was the moment when we saw that old man, recalled Friedman. Zurov wasn't with us at the time because he stuck out quite a bit, being six foot two and wearing a kipper. He wanted to get some discreet shots of the house. My director of photography said, I'm not being funny, but there's a very old man walking into the house. We saw him and the woman with him, and we knew that she was Heim's ex-wife. There were five to ten minutes when we thought it was plausible it was him. The search for former SS Hauptsturmführer Dr. Aribert Heim, known to history as Dr. Death, had taken Zurov and Friedman to Chile and Germany in their efforts to locate him, chasing leads and rumours. Hunting for Heim had become akin to searching for the Loch Ness Monster. People had come forward in Chile with recent sightings of a tall, German-speaking man who was extremely old, with a prominent scar on his cheek, a description of the Simon Wiesenthal Center's number one quarry. Dr. Zurov knew that Heim's illegitimate daughter, Waltrud, was living in a small town in southern Chile called Puerto Montt, where local informants had said that a man matching Heim's description had been seen. The first thing I felt when I was in Chile was that this was a very good hiding place, said Friedman. Not only is it completely separate from Europe and the horrors of the Second World War, but it is separated by the mountain range of the Andes. It all seemed too good to be true, and with a reward of €315,000 on offer for information leading to Dr. Death's capture, a lot was at stake. Heim's daughter had finally relented to a private interview with Zurov, during which she claimed that she had never met her father and did not know anything about his whereabouts. Zurov knew that the Heim family was wealthy. Indeed, the main reason why Heim was believed to be alive at the time was the fact that his bank accounts, frozen by the West German government after he fled from Europe in the early 1960s, still contain £1.7 million that could be claimed by Heim's sons if they could prove he was dead. Even in 2010, the money remained untouched in Heim's German accounts. For many, including Zurov, the fact that no members of the Heim family claimed the fortune provided prima facie evidence that the evil doctor was still alive. Dr. Zurov was intrigued to visit Baden-Baden, the beautiful spa town in Germany where Aribert Heim had quietly practiced gynecology after the war, until he was identified as a Nazi war criminal and was forced to flee. The family home in Baden-Baden was a huge white Victorian building in a quiet, leafy suburb, where Heim's ex-wife still lives. Zurov realised, after he saw the house, that Heim could have been financially sustained by his family with ease during the almost 50 years that he spent on the run from justice. Perhaps Heim had even returned to live incognito in his former home in Baden-Baden, hoping that he would be free to live out his remaining years in freedom and peace after hoodwinking the world about his whereabouts for decades. Zurov had been told that a tall, very old man lived in the property. It almost seemed too easy, but the lead proved to be yet another trail gone cold. We showed Zurov the footage, and he didn't think it was Heim, said Friedman. No one seen a photo of him for 40 years. 
The man Friedman filmed turned out to be the new husband of Heim's ex-wife and another tall, retired doctor. There were moments in the 12-month period when I thought we may actually find this guy, said Friedman. But you do get a bit carried away when you're that close to it. In March 1979, Dr. Heim wrote, As early as 1961, I was warned that I had no reasonable chance to endure a fair concentration camp trial, because if only one witness would have testified against me, the person who warned me said, this will be taken as the truth. Heim was at pains to point out in the written rebuttals to the charges of war crimes levelled against him from the 1960s onwards that he was innocent of the lies of the witnesses who had spoken out as early as 1946. What had Aribert Heim done to earn himself the name Dr. Death at Mauthausen concentration camp? According to the witness statements, and to Nazi hunters like Ephraim Zurov, Heim was nothing more than a sadist who enjoyed inflicting pain upon helpless Jewish inmates for no medical reason. Unlike Dr. Josef Mengele, who inflicted terrible suffering in the course of what was for him a genuine medical research program, however perverted and immoral, Heim's activities were not even dressed up as Nazi research. One of these sadistic acts that has followed Heim around since Mauthausen was his penchant for removing inmates' heads so that he could use the skulls as desk ornaments. The six-foot-four-inch tall Heim had trained as a doctor in Vienna, qualifying in 1939. Born in the Austrian town of Radkesburg, Heim's father, Josef, had been a district commander in the gendarmerie. On the 17th of April 1940, Heim had reported of a training with the SS Reserve Battalion Deutschland in Munich, and according to a handwritten resume that Heim wrote decades later, he had served in the invasion of France as a mere car driver. On the 1st of August 1940, Heim had been commissioned as an SS Untersturmführer in the medical battalion in Prague, and he later worked in the Red Cross Hospital's surgical department in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. Heim was transferred back to Germany in April 1941, where he was attached to the Oranienburg concentration camp outside Berlin, claiming that he was an assistant in the surgical department. He remained at Oranienburg until the 19th of June, when he transferred to Buchenwald concentration camp as a troop doctor of the soldier guards, as he put it. The day after he arrived at Buchenwald, his elder brother was killed in action in Crete, where he was serving as a Luftwaffe paratrooper. Heim's next posting, on the 14th of July 1941, was to the reserve battalion of the elite Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler Regiment at Berlin Lichtefelder, the Führer's lifeguard regiment, where he was a medical officer. Heim claimed in his resume that in October 1941 he was loaned out to the Mauthausen concentration camp, where his responsibilities were as a medical officer supporting the guards, and as a surgeon in the camp infirmary treating inmates. Heim claimed that he was only at Mauthausen for seven weeks, but those seven weeks would lead him to becoming notorious in the camp system and earn him the moniker Dr. Death. It has been claimed that Heim worked closely at Mauthausen with the camp pharmacist, SS Obersturmführer Dr. Erik Vazicki, particularly in a series of experiments that were seemingly conducted to test how quickly a human heart could be stopped with a variety of different substances. Heim was accused of having murdered large numbers of patients by injecting into their hearts various poisonous substances, including petrol. Vasicki was a fellow Austrian who was instrumental in the selection and murder by gassing of inmates both at Mauthausen and at the Schloss Hartheim Institute, where the Germans ran their illicit T4 euthanasia program under the supervision of Franz Stangl. Vasicki, who served at Mauthausen between 1941 and 1944, was intimately involved with Walter Rauf's gas truck experiments in mass murder conducted as part of the T4 program. 12,000 people were murdered in the gas trucks, where the further 3,100 perished in the gas chamber at the Hartheim Institute. 
Vaziki was the SS doctor who was charged with the establishment of the gas chambers at Hartheim and Mauthausen, and it was Vaziki who actually delivered the metal canisters of Cyclone B to the SS NCOs, who dropped the crystals through a vent in the roof of the chambers to kill those inside. As a pharmacist, the 30-year-old Vaziki was obviously extremely well-placed to assist Dr. Heim in his alleged experiments at the camp hospital in 1941. Vaziki did not manage to flee at the end of the war, and he was charged with murder by a U.S. military tribunal in 1945. On the 13th of May 1946, Vaziki was found guilty, and on the 28th of May 1947, he was hanged in Landsberg Prison in Germany. Less than a year after Dr. Ephraim Zurov and Dov Friedman had been jetting between Chile and Germany on the trail of Aribert Heim, a man handed an old and dusty brown leather briefcase to a representative of the New York Times in Cairo, Egypt. When the contents of the case were examined, it appeared that the mystery of Heim's existence on the run had been solved, and that Heim had died over a decade before. German police experts were eventually permitted to travel to Egypt to check out the story, and a careful forensic examination of the briefcase and its contents was conducted. Analysis of dust showed the briefcase had been in North Africa for a number of years, confirmed the German police. They also confirmed that the handwriting of the documents inside was indeed Heim's. Heim's son, Rudiger, had earlier claimed that his father had settled in Cairo and had died in the city in 1992 of rectal cancer. Rudiger claimed that he had been at his father's side when he died. Even more interestingly, Rudiger claimed that Heim had converted to Islam and that he had changed his name to Tarek Hussein Farid and had spent the last decade of his life living in the Casa El Madina Hotel. The family who used to own the hotel, the Domas, discovered the briefcase in Heim's apartment and kept it, later handing it over to the New York Times. The briefcase contained a treasure trove of documents, including handwritten articles penned by Heim on a subject he appears to have become obsessed about, the 13th tribe, or the Khazar Empire, and he had penned a report on anti-Semitism, about the last subject one would have associated with a Nazi war crime subject. His type report, written in English, carefully lists the number of Jews in the world between 1939 and 1947, taking into account the six million who were exterminated by the Nazis, the total number of Semitic Arabs, and the total number of the people in Palestine in 1918. And then Heim created a mailing list for the distribution of his report, including world leaders and American elected officials. The general thrust of Heim's research appears to have been the disproving of the purported Semitic ancestry of a people he calls the Khazars, or non-Semitic Jews. According to Heim, the Russian Khazars' descendants live in the United States and form the, quote, Jewish lobby, unquote. Heim seemingly wanted to expose them as fraudulent Jews, writing in a covering letter that the recipients of the report, quote, should be aware of the true history facts and not hide their identity, unquote. Also stuffed into the case were Heim's rebuttals of the charges made against him by Jewish survivors of Mauthausen, a resume he had written outlining his life until the 1950s, visa documents under the names of Ferdinand Heim and Tarek Hussein Farid, and an Egyptian death certificate issued under the latter name in 1992. There was even a copy of an article from the German magazine Der Spiegel, which was published in 1979, discussing his wartime activities in the camps, in which Heim had carefully underlined passages that he disagreed with in red ink, adding the German word for slander in the top left-hand corner. I'm glad that it has been confirmed that my father lived in Egypt, and I'm very optimistic that there will be an official confirmation of his death in the near future, said Rudiger Heim. Confirmation has been a long time coming and remains pending. 
Based on the documents found in Heim's briefcase, confirmation of his death would appear to be a straightforward matter, and one would have expected Rudiger and his brother to have claimed their father's frozen fortune. But this has not occurred. Handwriting analysis has confirmed beyond all doubt that the written documents in the case were penned by Aribert Heim. His photo appears on Egyptian residency papers issued between 1963 and 1967 in the name Ferdinand Heim, and the passport numbers, place of birth, Radkusburg, Austria, and date of birth, June 28, 1914, match Heim's, and, importantly, also exactly match a set of Egyptian residency papers that identify a German named Tariq Hussein Farid, from 1982, also found in the case. A death certificate for Farid, issued on the 10th of August 1992, is also usefully part of the contents of the case. If further proof were required of the identity of Ferdinand Heim, the briefcase also had several bank receipts, recording money sent to the National Bank of Egypt to Aribert Heim by his sister, Hertha Bart, in December 1970. We don't doubt the suitcase belonged to Heim or that he was in Egypt, said Ephraim Zurov in 2009. We do not agree there is evidence that he died there. There is no body, no burial place, no proof that he died in Egypt. Dr. Zurov has pointed out on several occasions that if Haim is indeed dead, why then has the 1.7 million euros sitting in a German bank account not been claimed by his family? The Haim briefcase and its collective documents has about them the whiff of a setup. Perhaps Heim was moved, with the assistance of his family, from Egypt to some other undisclosed location, perhaps even to Chile, where he has a daughter and a son-in-law, and the briefcase was disclosed in an attempt to throw Nazi hunters like Zurov off the scent. We shall return to the missing body alluded to by Dr. Zurov momentarily. Certainly, Dove Friedman had his doubts. It's a murky story, he said. There are so many uncertainties. Rudiger claimed Heim had converted to Islam and was living in Cairo. It was almost just too perfect, as there's no one to confirm the story. Egypt is notorious for being a difficult place to penetrate. We tried to get to Cairo to confirm the story, but we had our visas denied. Unquote. Inside the briefcase, written in German, was a detailed rebuttal of all the accusations of war crimes that had been made against Heim by Jewish survivors of Mauthausen. Quote, just imagine this accusation of having, just out of boredom, forced young people to undergo surgery in order to intentionally cause their deaths by removing vital organs, such as heart, liver, spleen and bowel, with the aim of possessing skulls for personal purposes, wrote Heim on the 19th of March 1979. What crueler deed could accuse me a doctor of than these brutalities and bestialities? Unquote. Heim was particularly incensed by the accusations made by famed Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal. Quote, in 1978, Wiesenthal said on television that when I took these organs from these people, I had operated on them even without anesthesia, i.e. I treated them worse than a butcher when he kills animals. One would have had to strap these victims all around the operating table, and the cries of the victims would have reverberated through the camp. Unquote. Heim told his son Rudiger that he had even considered voluntarily returning to Germany in 1979 so that he could clear his name at a trial, but he came to believe that the Jewish victims' testimonies would prove too conclusive and he would have to spend the rest of his life behind bars. Another document, written in English, carefully outlined Heim's daily duties at Mauthausen, where he attempted to portray himself as a simple army doctor, performing the duties that he had been assigned. Quote, My work began at eight o'clock in the morning, with the treatment of the soldiers in the troops' quarter, which was outside of the inmates' camp. The treatment lasted about two hours. Then it followed the treatment of the inmates in the infirmary station of the camp, achieving small surgery as carbuncles, abscesses, and a visit to the sick room of the infirmary. With that, the morning time from 8 to 1 o'clock was passed. 
unquote. In Heim's statement, the afternoons at Mauthausen were equally straightforward and non-controversial. Quote, in the afternoon it followed to the treatment of the soldiers and a visit to the sick room of the infirmary. Occasionally I took smear checks in the camp's brothel and I visited ill persons of the soldiers' families. Unquote. Heim only admitted to performing two major surgeries during the seven weeks that he was at Mauthausen. Quote, Additionally, I achieved two emergency operations, namely an appendectomy at a girl inmate of the brothel and an operation, hernia and intestines, of a 70 years old male inmate who died directly after the operation due to a circulatory disorder. Unquote. Heim strongly rejected that the camp was even in the business of killing its inmates. Quote, During my stay in the months October November 1941 in the camp, it has not existed a secret order for euthanasia for sick and disabled inmates. Selections were not achieved, likewise, poison injections were not delivered. Unquote. Heim was emphatic in his denials of having done nothing wrong, although all of his rebuttals concerning war crimes appeared to be made whilst he was in hiding and living under a false name. The Nuremberg defense had been legally rejected decades before. Quote, I was ordered to the Camp Mauthausen as a doctor for the soldier guardians, and did only serve by way of a makeshift in the camp infirmary. I was not responsible for events in the camp infirmary, which could happen without my presence, because I was doctor for the soldiers only, unquote, he wrote in broken English. The last statement is contradictory, as Heim had already admitted that part of his duties was treating inmates as well as guards. Quote, all other events in the camp reported in the prosecution are for me so new, as they were new for the investigation authority. This I declare herewith in lieu of an oath. Unquote. Heim wrote that he left Mauthausen on the 24th of November 1942 and was posted to the SS Field Hospital in Vienna. For nine months throughout 1942, Heim records that he served as a doctor for the medical examination board that selected young men for the SS, and on the 1st of September 1942, he was promoted to SS Obersturmführer, or lieutenant. Like Dr. Josef Mengele, Heim also saw combat, and for just over two years he served with the 6th SS Mountain Division Nord on the Eastern Front, primarily in northern Finland, during which time he was wounded in action. Heim was awarded the Iron Cross Second Class for his bravery under fire, as well as the Infantry Assault Badge and the Wound Badge in black. Promoted to SS Hauptsturmführer or Captain on the 20th of April 1944, Heim served on the Western Front in the Vosges Mountains in France from the 1st of January 1945 until he was captured by the US Army on the 15th of March. In common with many other Nazi war crime suspects, Heim was not placed on trial whilst he was a prisoner of the Americans. In the confusion that reigned after the end of hostilities, and with literally millions of German prisoners in their hands, war criminals found it relatively easy to claim to be different people from different branches of the armed forces. Heim stated that he worked as a prisoner doctor in American POW camp hospitals in France in 1945-46, to and was later interned in Germany in 1947 before being released. By 1948, Aribert Heim was practicing medicine at Bad Nauheim and Jagsfeld in Germany, as well as being an active member of an ice hockey club in Bad Nauheim. Interestingly, Heim always made sure that he was out of frame when any team photographs were taken. Other than this precaution, Heim appeared not to live in fear of arrest for his wartime activities. Between 1950 and 1962, he practiced at the Women's Hospital in Ludwigshafen and later in Baden-Baden and published several papers on gynaecology in medical journals under his own name. On the 14th of January 1957, Heim had become a German citizen and he was rich enough that the following year he bought an entire apartment building in Berlin the rents maintaining him in some style in his large Baden-Baden property.
The money that Hai made in the 1950s and 60s constituted the 1.7 million euros sitting in frozen German bank accounts, and which can only be claimed by his sons if it is proved that Haim is dead. Haim himself had no access to his money since the late 1970s and received financial assistance from his family and other unknown sources. Haim first became aware that he was being sought for war crimes in 1961, when his name came up concerning witness statements from Mauthausen survivors. His escape from justice the following year was more by chance rather than by design. Haim had continued to practice medicine in Baden-Baden, but he had been warned that he would not get a fair trial by fellow former Nazis. Nevertheless, I did not want to believe this and stayed at home, wrote Haim in 1979. In the fall of 1962, it was only sheer coincidence that the police could not arrest me because I was not at home at the time. It appears that Haim was in Frankfurt from May 1962, and it was in that city that he wrote out a new will, dividing his assets between his two sisters and two sons, as he was now divorced from his wife. This document was found inside the dusty briefcase in Cairo in 2009. According to the documents discovered in Egypt, Haim made his first residency application in Cairo in 1963 under the name Ferdinand Haim. Ferdinand was Haim's middle name. It also appears from the documentary evidence that Haim was able to live off the proceeds of the rents collected at the large Berlin apartment building that he owned until the West German government froze his accounts in the late 1970s. Bank receipts discovered in 2009 clearly showed that Haim's sister was sending him money. So what of Haim's years in hiding in Egypt? The Egyptian government remained hypersensitive regarding having sheltered Nazi war criminals, and they flatly denied that Dr. Death was ever a guest in their country. It's nonsense, said General Hamdi Abdel Karim of the Interior Ministry in 2009. There was no evidence he was here. It's a fabricated story. The Egyptian government certainly has as shady a past regarding giving sanctuary to Nazi fugitives as South American nations like Argentina and Brazil. Haim found himself in familiar company when he sought shelter in Cairo in the 1960s, for many Nazis were already working for the Egyptian government. Among the Arab nations, many leaders viewed the German assault on the Jews to be acceptable, and also helpful in solving the Palestine problem. In February 1945, with the German defeat inevitable, Syria, Egypt, Lebanon and Saudi Arabia had all declared war on Germany, largely so that they could qualify for membership of the new United Nations. Their governments remained, for the most part, fairly pro-Nazi, and like Peron's Argentine government, they resolved to use Nazi fugitives for their own ends. Whereas Peron had wanted scientists and engineers, President Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt wanted Dr. Goebbels' propaganda experts, commenting, We will use the services of those who know the mentality of our enemies. The term enemies Nasser used when referring to the fledgling Jewish state of Israel, which bordered Egypt across the Sinai Peninsula. Nasser opened Egypt's doors to Nazi fugitives, refusing all requests to extradite them for trial in Europe, including requests that were made by his Soviet and Eastern European allies. In 1953, when rumours circulated that Hitler was still alive, a prominent Egyptian newspaper invited prominent citizens to publish letters to the Führer. Anwar al-Sadat, who was later president of Egypt between 1970 and 1981, wrote, My dear Hitler, I congratulate you from the bottom of my heart. Even if you appear to have been defeated, in reality you are the victor. You succeeded in creating dissensions between Churchill, the old man, and his allies, the sons of Satan. President Nasser gave sanctuary to some very unpleasant Nazi war criminals. Franz Bartel had been the assistant chief of the Gestapo in the Polish city of Katowice. By 1959, he was working for the Department of Jewish Affairs in the Egyptian Ministry of Information in Cairo and using the name El Hussein. 
His former boss, SS Standartenführer Rudolf Mildner, was also in Cairo. Mildner had also been the head of the political department at Auschwitz, where he had interrogated prisoners. During his period in charge, he had over 2,000 Poles executed. In September 1943, Mildner was appointed Gestapo chief in Denmark, but the Jewish population was forewarned of the planned German roundups, and most of them fled to neutral Sweden. Following this failure, Mildner was transferred to the city of Kassel, before heading the SD in Vienna, and finally in the Austrian city of Linz, before he was captured by the US Army in May 1945. Mildner testified at the Nuremberg trials against his boss, Dr. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, and after being released in 1949, he fled to Egypt to avoid prosecution for war crimes. Also working for the Egyptian government was former SS Untersturmführer Wilhelm Böckler, who had played a prominent part in the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto in 1944. In Cairo, he worked for the Israel Department in the Ministry of Information. Medical men were also well represented. Alongside Heim was Dr. Hans Eiseler, formerly the chief doctor at Buchenwald concentration camp, and he died in Cairo in 1965. Former SS Gruppenführer Alois Moser became an instructor of paramilitary youth groups in Cairo, and Erich Altern, using the name Ali Bella, former regional SD chief in Galicia, was recruited as an instructor at Palestinian terrorist camps. The list of ex-Nazis in Egypt was long and remains deeply embarrassing for the Egyptian government, hence the blanket denials. The anti-Jewish and anti-Israeli government that Colonel Nasser led in Egypt even embraced Nazi ideology. For example, in 1959, the Institute for the Study of Zionism was created in Cairo. It employed several former Goebbels propaganda men, including Luis Haydn, who translated Hitler's book Mein Kampf into Arabic. The books were then distributed as free gifts to Egyptian army officers. It also maintained contacts with neo-Nazi groups, including Britain's National Front. Regardless of official denials from Cairo, the evidence that Haim was in the city in the past is overwhelming. Journalists interviewed several local people who all remembered a tall German who was still recalled with some affection by those who knew him, including the Doma family who owned the hotel where Haim was supposed to have lived for over a decade until his death. According to the Egyptians who knew him, Haim would walk the bustling streets of Cairo for hours each day, visiting the Al-Azhar Mosque and dropping by the J. Groppi Cafe, where he would order cakes to be delivered to his friends and buy sweets for their children. The children would address Haim as Uncle Tariq. Mahmoud Doma, the son of the owner of the hotel where Haim resided, said, He was like a father. He loved me and I loved him. Doma recalled a man who was kind, neighbourly and who spoke Arabic, English and French, beside his native German, a man who studied a German language copy of the Quran and a man who loved children. In the summer, Heim bought tennis rackets and a net and set up a makeshift court on the hotel roof where he would play with Doma and the other children until sundown. The most troubling aspect of the story of Arabert Haim in Egypt is not his life in Cairo, but the circumstances of his reported death and the disposal of his body. It was during the Olympics, stated Haim's son Rudiger after his father's passing in 1992. There was a television in the room and he was watching the Olympics. It distracted him. He must have been suffering from serious pain. Medical documents discovered in Haim's Cairo briefcase show that he was undergoing treatment for rectal cancer from 1990 until his recorded death. The death certificate issued for Tariq Hussein Farid records him as being 81 years old, when Haim was actually 78 in 1992. According to Rudiger, his father had left instructions that his body was to be donated to medical science, but that this request was extremely difficult to be carried out in a Muslim country, where the body must not be desecrated, and it must be buried very quickly. Instead, Rudiger recounted that his 
father's friend Mahmoud Doma and himself bribed a hospital official to take the body to the Doma family crypt. But that when the authorities found out, they forced Rudiger to have his father's body wrapped in a white sheet and sealed inside a plain wooden coffin interred in an unmarked common grave in Cairo. If true, there is absolutely no way that investigators can ever find Heim's remains for DNA testing, in the same way as the remains of Josef Mengele were tested to finally confirm his death and halt the ongoing hunt for him. It is more than likely in 2020 that Dr. Heim is indeed dead, otherwise he would be at least 104 years old. But unravelling the mysterious circumstances of his death remains very, very interesting. The subsequent activities of Rudiger Heim have raised more than a few eyebrows in the Nazi hunting community. In the summer of 2008, Rudiger tried to have his father legally declared dead so that he could inherit the large sum of money held in the frozen German bank accounts. Rudiger claimed that he would donate the money to charity. After the discovery of the briefcase full of documents in Egypt that have subsequently been authenticated by the German police as having belonged to his father, Rudiger told reporters that he would try again to have his father declared dead. The Simon Wiesenthal Center's head Nazi hunter, Dr. Zuroff, said the latest development of the hunt for Aribert Heim has raised, quote, more questions than it answers. There's no body, no corpse, no DNA, no grave. We can't sign off on a story like this because of some semi-plausible explanation. Keep in mind these people have a vested interest in being declared dead. It's a perfectly crafted story. That's the problem. It's too perfect. Unquote. Guy Walters, in his book Hunting Evil, has stated that, in his opinion, Heim died in Egypt in 1992. He expended many pages of his book to criticising the late Simon Wiesenthal, and he has a similar attitude towards Wiesenthal's successor, Dr. Ephraim Zuroff. The Nazi hunters' July 2008 trip to Argentina and Chile in a final attempt to determine whether Heim was still alive, Walters dismisses as, quote, a publicity exercise in order to promote the Wiesenthal Center, the main activities of which are fighting anti-Semitism and defending Israel. Nazi hunting is a minority activity for the center, but it is a useful brand builder, unquote. Walters asserts that Zurov's refusal to accept the proof of Heim's death in Cairo is based upon his selfish desire to keep Heim alive in the public imagination because, quote, dead Nazis can no longer be hunted, and without something to chase, Nazi hunters will soon be out of work, unquote. Walters' comments do not take into account the many younger Nazi war criminals that Zurov has exposed. So the question remains unanswered today. Did Dr. Aribert Heim die in Cairo in 1992? Did he perhaps move somewhere else, probably Chile, as is suspected by Nazi hunters, and live on a few more years before succumbing to extreme old age? Or, incredibly, is Dr. Death still alive somewhere, a 104-year-old relic from the darkest days of World War II? This particular mystery may never be solved. You have been listening to Ratlines, the hunt for Nazi war criminals, written and narrated by Mark Felton. For video documentaries on a wide range of military history topics, visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions, details below. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, which is very much appreciated. Please see the description box for details. Thank you.